morning. My name is Martise Harper. Isn't it thought-provoking that oftentimes we tend to camouflage our best selves or even hide the best us? I know because I am guilty of doing the very same thing. But here at St. Peter United, you don't have to hide any longer. You can let your best self come forth and then God get the glory. So come and join us as we lift up praises to our God. Um, so I won't be before you long. Um, we're going to read out of First Corinthians. Alrighty. So we'll be reading First Corinthians chapter thirteen, verses one through seven. First Corinthians chapter thirteen, verses one through seven, and I'll be reading from the NIV version. And it reads, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. That is the word of God for the people of God. Let us go into prayer. Spirit of the Most High, we thank you and we honor you. We thank you for the things seen and unseen. We thank you for being omnipotent and omnipresent in our lives and as we go. Lord God, we come to you asking that you would continue to love. Love us in a way that, that you always have loved. Show us how to receive love. We ask that you would remove me from my flesh so that, that, so that I may be present in the spirit. We ask that you would open the hearts and ears of all those who are here today. And this is your name, we pray, amen. Alrighty, so if I had to tag this message, it would be, what's love got to do with it? <laughs> um, that's funny because my fave, Marcus, loves Tina Turner. But seriously, what does love have to do with it, right? And more often than not, I seem to find myself in conversations where I'm asked a question like, how do I know if I'm receiving healthy love? I typically respond in the same way, and I, I tell everyone to define love in their own words. And people tend to struggle to find a less complex version of what love is and literally have to break down experiences that they've had. And they'll say things like, I love hard, so whenever I love somebody, I give them anything, even the shirt off of my back, as long as they treat me right. And that statement alone shows me that people's version of unconditional love actually seems very conditional. If you say things like, as long as they treat me right, you're only thinking about how a situation will affect you and your ego, or the need to benefit from giving something to someone. Then your love is conditional. The harsh reality that we all have to face 
is being okay with the fact that the love that we give may not look like the love we receive in return. You'll run your head into a brick wall trying to measure and contain love to a box because love is limitless. I'm even guilty of this, <laughs> but sometimes we'll even exhaust ourselves trying to chase after a mirrored reflection of the love that we give, and when we notice that what we give is not being reciprocated, that love starts to turn into unintentional nothingness. You start to become dull and numb and everything to everything. So, so when someone is giving you unconditional love, you don't even know how to accept it, right? So, Love is an action word that either makes a person become in tune with who they are and what they have to offer, or would consequently force them into a state of denial. That denial brings thoughts to surface, thoughts that you're not worthy of love because of things that you've done in your past, that you will never amount to anything because of what someone told you thoughts that you've never experienced real love before because you've been hurt and scarred so much. Your thoughts even, your thoughts even have the audacity to compile all of your relational experiences together, which creates a bucket of tears and fears. By relational experiences, I mean generational hurt that has been passed down and given to you or maybe even your longest relationship was broken because of a compromise of trust. So tell yourself, I'm not gonna be in a serious relationship anymore, or I have a hard time trusting people. Let me tell you something. You are giving other people too much power over a heart that was protected by God. Have you ever been in a situation where it felt like all that you knew about love had you questioning some things? There are even times when love doesn't feel like a display of action or an affection, but more like an act of obligation, which is why people find themselves stuck in situations. They're stuck because they're sticking to social norms and going along with the status quo. Maybe this applied to you because you felt obligated to date and marry people that would be approved by the people that you love. And so living in your truth felt far-fetched. Or maybe you even felt obligated to do things you don't necessarily want to do because the person you love so much wants it for you. And it'll leave you wondering why why it feels like the gift shift of life will not move out of park. No matter how hard you try to disengage the brakes, everything and everybody else keeps passing you by. And I'm here today to tell you that it is time for you to do things that make you happy and is in alignment with God's call on your life. The writer of the Painted Prayer Book Jan Richardson said, love is always risky because we cannot enter into it without being changed, altered, or transformed. So in the face of this, we ask, do I really want this? Do I really desire to be so undone? Love is never just about opening our hearts. It's about being willing to have our hearts become larger as we make room for people and stories and experiences we never imagined even holding. It's about being willing to have our hearts become deeper as we move beyond the surface layers of our assumptions and habits in order to truly see and receive what and who is in front of us. You will ask questions like, well, how is it that I've been consistently loving everybody, even my enemies, but I'm not really seeing for myself how my love for everyone 
changes the way that I receive it. Okay, I'm gonna stick a pen in it. Pen in it. To be consistent is to act or do in the same way over an extended period of time. So you're expecting the way that you receive love to change, but haven't changed the way that you actually give love. Mm. So you're expecting the way that you receive love to change, but you haven't changed the way that you actually give love. Okay, moving on. On the other hand, to be persistent is to continue firmly in spite of difficulty or opposition. So there's a difference between consistently loving and persistently loving. If I love consistently, then that means I do not know how to adjust and I end up faltering and conforming to situations that arise and as a result, I put my guard up. I'm scared. To love persistently means that even though today doesn't look like yesterday or because me and my boo got into a disagreement or even because my friend and I fell out the other day, I will still persist in love because these difficulties are small things to a giant. Point to yourself and declare, my love is unconditional. Ah. So in my research, Google told me that love is an intense feeling of deep affection. So loving something or someone looks like becoming one with your emotions and seeking the most genuine level of understanding. In verse four, it says that love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy or boast, it's not proud, it does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, not easily angered, and watch this, it keeps no record of wrong. Some of us keep tabs. You say things like, in 2012, I remember when you hurt me. And in 2014, you did the same thing to someone else. We as a people have to learn how to control, alt, delete those tabs. <laughs> Devaney made a Facebook post joke about keeping Buku tabs open on the internet browser, and I'm one of those people. <laughs> but you ever notice that when you keep several tabs open on your internet browser, your heart, I mean, I mean, your hard drive becomes full of cookies and malware, and your computer has trust, I mean, latency issues. It can't keep up with the speed in which you're moving, so the question I pose to you is how do you love? Are you keeping tabs? Do you love with arrogance? Do you love hard but can be mean at times? Do you love in hopes that you'd get the same amount of love in return? Or do you love in a way that God loves? See, there are three types of love in the context in which we're talking about today. There's eros, which means an erotic desire or sexual love. I'll be honest, I have a little celebrity crush, it's cool, but I would classify that as Eros love. And I don't know that person, they don't know me, but I love the way that they look. I like the excitement I get when I see them in their element. There's no relationship that exists, and I will probably find that if I, if I meet them, I probably won't like their personality in real life because they stuck up, you know? But all of those things doesn't change the way that I see them, right? That's an Eros kind of love. On the other hand, you have Philos, which can be related to storge, meaning devoted or friendship or an affectionate love. I have Philos specifically with people in my community. I love them and I express the love I have for them outwardly or maybe even after a failed relationship, you remain friends with your former partner. I know that's hard to do, but the both of you share a mutual type of love. That's phylos. Even though Eros love may have existed at some point or another, when Eros love is removed, phylos love should remain. Last but not least, oh, this is my favorite one. There's agape love. 
also known as the highest love, and is the sacrificial and unconditional love of God. Psalms 86 and 15 says, but you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Abounding means very plentiful or to be full of. And congruent with God's love being plentiful, it's also steadfast, which means resolutely or dutifully firm and unwavering. So in other words, God is so loyal to us that even when we are unsure of how to love ourselves, God's love is still consistent. The reason we may feel that God's love is not persistent is because what we may consider as difficulty or opposition is just strength building from God to us. Maybe that went over your head. I'm going to say it again. The reason we may feel that God's love is not persistent is because what we may consider as difficulty or opposition is just strength building from God to us. Flex your muscle and say, God is my personal trainer. Ah. We're in a time where society is normalizing self-love and self-care. And I, I love that for us. But as a result, we'll follow social media platforms and get certified from the University of YouTube A&M. And we end up dismissing the love that has never wavered. We get so caught up and trying to repair our own hearts with self-love and completely ignore God's unwavering love. Self-love alone is not going to carry you through the times that you're experiencing low and depressive moments. Self-love is not going to allow you to wake up each day and, and be protected by the angels of grace. Self-love has to coexist with God's unwavering love because when you can't manage to pick yourself up, God's love is always consistently present. And I know that if God be for me, who can be against me? Ah, okay. All right, all right, all right. Everybody, repeat after me. Say, recognize, reflex, reconcile and restitution. Good, you got it. Now that you know that you are a recipient of unwavering and unconditional love, what should you do? What does that look like for you? I'm glad you asked. I have four points, and I'm going to take my seat. Point number first, recognize where you are and identify what has happened or is happening that disconnects you from receiving unconditional love. That means calling out your insecurities, verbalizing the things that hurt you, spend time with yourself, God, and a therapist to find self-awareness and start your healing journey. The second thing is to activate your reflexes. This may look like you acting the moment you feel love. Okay, I understand healthy love may or may not feel familiar to you, so I'll explain it for you. When you start to experience it, your mind, your heart, and your tongue is stimulated to the point that it causes a natural reflex. A natural reflex is to say, I love you too, when someone states that they love you, right? But... Understanding your position in God's kingdom causes a spiritual reflex of praise and thanksgiving, saying, I love you, Lord. Thank you, Spirit, without a second thought. And tears begin to run down your face as you internalize lyrics like, I won't go back, I can't go back to the way it used to be before your presence came and changed me. And that release of tension on your heart will allow you to feel more free than you have ever felt in your life. So that means it is time to activate your reflexes spiritually and naturally. Third point, 
reconcile your differences and false ideas about what love should look like. Oh, that's real hard to do. I understand, but let me tell you something. Reconcile your differences and false ideas about what love should look like. Tough love is not a thing. You may have experienced someone saying, I know they say, if you're my age or older, you know, okay, whatever. I think I'm the old people now, but I'm really not. Okay, anyways, <laughs> you may have experienced someone saying that they inflicted some sort of pain on you, whether physical or emotional, because they love you, but I, 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 that's not healthy. So I'm encouraging you to restore friendly relations with love and its meaning because you owe it to yourself. As mentioned before, love is limitless and cannot be boxed in. Do not try to restrain how you love. Lastly, claim your restitution. Be 100% committed to getting everything that was taken from you because of love. That includes your time, your emotions, your joy, the way that you speak, your confidence, your relationship with God. Guess what? It all belongs to you. If we look at verses 1 through 3 of chapter 13, it says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm not going to get into that, but I do know that there are some preachers that get in the pool pit that don't really love their people, um, and they just making a lot of noise because ain't nobody, okay. Anyways, if I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all of my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. That means that God do not honor boastfulness or arrogance. There's actually no formula on what actions to take when acting in love. However, we are encouraged to be humble, steadfast, and keep unwavering love at the core of our actions. All of the good deeds you do in your lifetime means absolutely nothing if it's not rooted in agape love. In closing, I'm going to leave you with this. You have to persistently love a consistent God that has no limits on how they love you. And knowing so, you can openly embrace the feeling of self-love. Love yourself first because you understand yourself. But just know that the only love greater than self-love is God's love. You are your most committed partner. For that, you have to give yourself grace when things don't necessarily go as intended in relationships with partners, families, friends. Don't matter. Life is always changing. Drifting out of love is more common than you think. But as you experience these changes, lean on what you know and trust yourself to persist despite all of the difficulties you may experience. Leave negative ideas of love in the past because God's promise of healthy and unwavering love is in front of you. You are worthy of ultimate happiness. Point to yourself and say, I am worthy of ultimate happiness. I deserve it, and I should accept it. Don't feel guilty when you feel it and when you receive it. Use it to help and not to harm. When you see someone else struggling to understand love, spread it without expectations to receive something in return. Be humble in all that you do. Once you've recognized where you are, you must activate 
your natural reflexes and your spiritual reflexes, then you must reconcile your differences and then you claim your restitution. Then and only then, you can pour your love into someone else and receive the healthiest form of love. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you because I made it through my first sermon. <laughs> thank you for just being amazing and just, oh, I just love you. Sometimes I don't even have no words. And the love that I feel is a representation of the love that you give me. We thank you for being consistent and showing us how to persist despite all difficulties and oppositions. We ask that you will continue to be a light on our path. We honor you and we praise you. Amen. <laughs>